problems, you can get fictitiously elevations. Homocysteine is also for folic acid deficiency, B6 deficiency, and if you have a thyroid problem, that can be elevated, and with the renal. So they're indirect tests, but you have to look at them with all the values. What we're seeing, though, is a lot of people under 400 who are really symptomatic of B12 deficiency, sometimes we'll see those elevated, which kind of shows, hey, like they get a B12 deficiency. If we would just raise what the current lower limit of B12, say from 200, say to 400 or 450 or even 500, but definitely we feel it should be 450 because by looking at all the literature of cases coming in and the people that we see, we know if you're 450 and below, you're starting to have a problem. We, we don't want you to wait to 200 until you're like really symptomatic or you have nerve damage because then we may not be able to reverse your problems. And then it, it, B12 deficiency doesn't happen over a day, over a week, over a couple months. It's progressive, it's a very right? very slow, insidious process. So if you're, say, 310, 350, and you're symptomatic and you're like have depression, you're on antidepressants, for you to get below the 200, what the CDC is suggesting, it's going to take you maybe a year, year and a half. You have poor health. And you have the risk of causing maybe permanent cognitive problems like dementia or causing permanent neuropathy or causing a fall, et cetera. Okay? So that's why we don't want to wait till you get below 200 because we already know that those neuropsychiatric symptoms begin and we know that the range is wrong. Okay. The other problem that we're finding is the serum methylmonic acid and the homocysteine, they're kind of all over the place. We've been seeing people for 10 years, you know, checking methylmonic acid, B12, homocysteine. If, and sometimes we get people that are way deficient and the MMA and homocysteine are fine. That doesn't mean that they don't have a deficiency. If you are symptomatic and one of those tests are abnormal, you treat. And we've found literature recently in the last, like, four years of, physician groups who have, who have done studies where they're finding what, what me and Dr. Stewart have also found in our own practices, that those, sometimes those tests are not really reliable. So if they're not as reliable and they're expensive, why don't we just raise the lower limit or treat people who are symptomatic? Now, when people are symptomatic, absolutely, we're not saying everything is B12 deficiency. Of course not. There are many reasons for many symptoms. We're saying that B12 should always be included in the diagnostic workup of a patient. And say if you can't find a reason for their problem and say they come back uh, 380, you need to treat that person with B12. Just as a physician would try a therapeutic trial of an antidepressant if you came into them and said, oh, I'm depressed or whatever, either they keep you on the drug, they up the drug, they lower the drug, or discontinue it, okay, or keep you on it forever. The same thing you can do with, with B12 therapy. You can give a, a clinical trial to see if it's working. Now, obviously, if a person is below... Um, 350, you've got a problem and you need to be treated. Absolutely. In our book, we advocate the lower limit being 450 and below because we're trying to, you know, catch you before you start having big problems. But we predominantly see people below 400 having, having major problems. Now, I want to get into B12 injections. I really want you to lay it out for the audience where you stand and why you stand where you stand about what you consider at this point in your investigations the most effective? Okay, well, my personal opinion and preference, I like the B12 injections. And I've been on B12 injections for, boy, at least probably 25 years now. Um, there are three different forms of B12 out there. One is cyanocobalamin, hydroxocobalamin, and methylcobalamin. And those are forms that are in- injectable, and they also make those forms in tablets or sublingual forms. Um, B12, there's, there's, in Sweden, they do use pills, and they say that the B12 is it's fine to treat people that way. But when you clinically look at people and you compare giving oral B12 versus injections, it's night and day. I think it really depends on why the person has a deficiency. Um, if you give enough sublingual B12, and some people successfully can be treated with, say, 5,000 micrograms, which equals 5 milligrams of B12 sublingual, always prefer the sublingual or lozenge tablet versus an oral tablet. 
because your body has to break it down and maybe it's not, if you don't have acid properly, et cetera, maybe you're not, you're getting it. You have to remember, too, what's the shelf life of these drugs? The sublingual and the tablets, they're not really well studied and the efficacy and each company is different in what they're putting in. We know that people, the coenzyme is methyl B12. Your body, when you take cyanocobalamin, has to convert. It's like four different steps, goes through your liver. You have to convert it. The body has to convert it to the coenzyme, which is methyl B12. And methyl B12 is the B12 that we need to utilize for the brain and the nervous system. So the bottom line is B12 injections are cheap. A 30 cc vial of hydroxyl cobalamin, which is a form that's available in the United States, it's made by a, a drug company. A 30 cc vial costs only 30, I checked the price the other day for somebody, it was $33.63. That vial will last a year, and I, that's the kind I use. It lasts me a year. And it's a multi-vial dose. You have to be very sterile when you draw it up, and you can self-inject your injections. B12 injections can be given in the muscle and can be given in the fatty tissue and the subcutaneous tissue. So my rationale is diabetics, they give themselves daily injections and they're able to handle it. Some of them are elderly. It's not painful. These small needles are not painful at all. Yeah, who are maybe even like debilitated, et cetera. And they're doing their injections of diabetics like every day or twice a day. You can surely handle giving an injection you know, bi-monthly or weekly. It's very easy. And the beauty of the B12, like insulin, you have to be completely, you know, 100% how much you're giving. So even drawing it up, it's very easy to mark. You'll be able to self-inject. And that's what we, if you go to a physician, they don't want you coming in all the time for injections. And that's why I think this protocol that they give you once a month is way too long for somebody to wait and to get an office appointment, to pay a copay, et cetera, in the beauty of your own home, you learn how to self-inject or you have a family member and you can take care of it. It would be cheaper. And you know you're getting it, you're getting it in your system. I'm not against the sublingual tablets. I think there is a place for them for, for many patients, especially for vegans and vegetarians, maybe for pregnant people. And I think it's definitely where if you're deficient, you absolutely could try the, the sublingual type and, and see if you get a response. But we do know that there's about 15, 20% of the people, they do much better on injections than the other. So the majority of the public, 80%, probably would do fine on high-dose sublingual. But what we do advocate, too, before everybody starts running out there and taking B12, if you are symptomatic or at risk, you need to baseline see where I'm at. Why do you want to know where you're at before you start taking it on your own? Is because you want to know, is my depression or my neuropathy, or my forgetfulness, et cetera, you know, you fell and you broke your hip, is, was this related to B12 deficiency? Why you want to know that? Maybe you can get off some of your other drugs. And if you are deficient, that's going to be a different protocol of how you treat. When you give an injection, you excrete like 90% within the first 24 hours, even like taking sub, sub, subliminal too. You have to rebuild your body stores. And then you have, there's, a different, there's a protocol you give when someone's deficient. So first of all, you need to know, was I deficient or not? Because you need to know. And then your doctor can try to figure out why is that person B12 deficient. There's causes, which will help you with your otherwise health, because it may lead them to diagnosing something else in you. Like, why is this person B12 deficient? So it may change the way you're being treated. The other reason, too, is there are some people that are injured out there that don't even know they're injured from B12 deficiency, and you have a malpractice suit. Maybe you're living, you know, you're debilitated, et cetera. So, and yes, you can't regain some of the nerve damage. Some people are permanently crippled, but absolutely you're going to need it for life and health, and you need that documented. You can't take B12 for a month or two months or, say, a month and then stop it for two months and then get your blood test. It doesn't work that way. You're going to screw up all your blood results. So if you, if you are symptomatic or at risk or older, you should get yourself tested, and then you go from there because that way will dictate what treatment program you need. They need to then look at your whole history and maybe, you know, certain psychiatric drugs or depression drugs, they're expensive. Certain ones you can't just abruptly stop. You have to be weaned off them, et cetera. But
But say if you have severe depression and you're B12 deficient,